Hi everyone, how you doing? Welcome to the first official video from North Pier Angling. Uh, we've been working very hard on the road to establishing this company and are just over the moon so excited to finally be launching and engaging with all of you. Uh, my name is Kevin. I founded North Pier Angling or NPA, excuse me, uh, in 2021 um, and have been working very hard in the in the time since to, to be ready for this upcoming season. Uh, while you'll see us here on YouTube, also on Instagram and Facebook, our bread and butter is actually our guiding service operating out of Western Massachusetts. Uh, make sure to head over to our website at northpeerangling.com. Uh, that'll also be linked in the description below. So you can check out what we do and uh, how you can book a trip with us. Um, before I go any further, I also just want to ask you to go ahead and hit the like button on this video, hit that subscribe button, as well as that notification bell so that you can be uh, kept up to date on all of our new content as it rolls out. Uh, without further ado, uh, my conversation today is with one of my best fishing buddies and best buddies of all time, uh, Max Beauchene. Um, Max and I met in college, but Max cut his teeth growing up in, in after, after school in his adulthood um, in the inshore fishery in North Carolina, as well as in Florida. Uh, very, very gifted and accomplished inshore saltwater angler. Um, however, now Max is out in the uh, South Platte uh, River region of Colorado on fly tackle, picking apart all of those, uh, those native and wild trout. So like so many of us, uh, Max has aspirations to be a pro, to be a guide. Um, very, very unique to Max. He has what I would call a, a singular and exceptional ethic and philosophy around navigating the road, uh, working on that road, evolving mindset and oneself to achieving those aspirations, um, you know, for our listeners today, and especially those of you who do have similar aspirations to both Max and I to be a guide, to be a pro. Um, I hope you find a massive amount of benefit out of what Max has to say. I can tell you right now that North Pier Angling would not be where it is today uh, without the massive amount of influence, help, advice, and support that Max has provided me, oh, not only over the last several months, but over the years that I've known him. Uh, without further ado, I, I really do hope that all of you enjoy the video today. Uh, make sure again to hit that like and subscribe button. And uh, thank you so much for being here. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Well, I guess we'll uh, get a little bit on top topic here. Yeah, give me one sec. I'm just gonna pull out one more thing of thread. That way I don't have to be up in this thing while you're talking. Yeah, I'll intro anyway a little bit. You can do your thing. So, uh, Welcome to, to everyone and anyone who's watching this. Thank you for being here. This is actually the first official piece of content from North Pier Angling, um, which is super, super exciting. This has been a long, long, long process in, in the making here since middle of last year till now. Um, so it's super exciting to finally be here. So thank you everyone who is here to support and to see what we have to say and what we're doing today. Um, today, my guest is Max Beauchen, um, one of my best fishing buddies ever, that's for sure. Um, we're just gonna do a little bit of time while we chat here today. Um, I am, shall we say, not a master tire, so I'm gonna keep it simple because I I don't like my ability to, to tie and talk at the same time. So I'm gonna be tying some brassies, keeping it simple, maybe just like random midge variations and stuff too because again it's gonna get bad if you try to watch me talk and tie anything else what do you got there max what you vicing up uh, i am tying uh some mercury flashback or not flashbacks mercury black beauties in uh size 22 i am uh i'm predominantly focused on the south Platte right now i'm on colorado um it is march 10th so we're kind of like in that transition period here coming out of the winter stuff moving into our like first initial beta hatches but it definitely seems right now like most of the fish that i've been seeing caught most of the fish that i've been catching have been coming on slowly getting larger mid midge variations so um i'm it's hard for me to tie for the future you know what i mean i'm always yeah. tying just for the next trip next trip next trip next trip so you guys will see me do, I'm doing some of these, um, just various pupating midge stuff. Um, I'm going to try to tie some midge dry flies possibly later on, but we'll see how far we get into this conversation. You know, how many, how many flies end up actually getting finished during, during this time, you know what I mean? But I totally feel it. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Nothing, you, nothing you complicated. Really, you really can't, I mean, this time of year, I mean, that's, you know, and we were talking about that the other day about, 
you know, how, how many eggs you can put in the basket of what happened last year and all that kind of crap. And I think the timing at this time of year really comes into that too. Cause it's like, dude, I mean, you can't plan anything for the future. <laughs> if, if there's really, a, if you're not going to plan it's, it's spring and fishing. Like that's for damn sure. Yeah. So I think you're uh, I think you're wise there because plans for fishing in March don't really come to fruition that often. Yeah, the midge is such a staple too. It's just I I will never feel not confident. You know what I mean? Yeah. Putting a a small midge in front of a fish that's not actively feeding on on something else, it just feels right. It always feels right. At least you've taken, it you've taken the time down there too, you know. And that's the thing. I think that's the thing. You know, for us, I think for a lot of people, especially in nymphing, just because it is the um, you know we talk a lot about feedback and you know how important that is for a learning curve and kind of building confidence and building skill. And I, I think it goes without saying in terms of feedback, you're probably getting the least in nymphing and it can definitely yeah. push you out, push you out the fastest and kind of keep you off the water. So, and then that's what Matt, that's what I got a lot of respect for because Max was out there while all of us were probably sitting inside tying and crying about it. Max was actually in that snow in the South Platte river Valley, actually picking apart those those lock lips with size 26s so i think you uh, yeah you gotta like to stay yeah. out of that realm <laughs> yeah and, and you know it's funny like one thing that i'll say um and i'll preface this by by saying i'm fairly new to trout fishing um not new to angling obviously but um you know kind of take all the specifics i say with a grain of salt but i do think i'm fairly good at like observing conditions and kind of figuring figuring out what's going on um on a certain day and one of the, one of the pieces of feedback I have actually really, I, cause I, I totally get what you're saying about it's hard to get feedback on the nipping stuff, but one piece of feedback that I really have gotten on the nipping stuff is the things that fish avoid. It's not necessarily things that fish go on, but it's very easy to see when a fish can, can automatically see a nymph coming from far away and just shut down, avoid it altogether out the get-go. One of the things that I like about the midges so much is if we kind of like, you know, it's easy to look at a, a size 24 and size 26 and kind of wonder to yourself after a couple drifts, you know, did that fish even see that fly? Um, were they even like aware that it's there? But as long as we can like stick to what we know logically about fishing, which is trout have incredible eyesight, they are able to pick out these bugs and pick out these things. Um, one thing that I've noticed about the midges more so than anything else, and I, I mean, this is all ob fairly obvious stuff, is um, the fish are a lot less likely to actively avoid it. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to eat it every time, mm -hmm. but whenever I see a fish actively avoid something, I, in my brain, I'm automatically just like, yeah, that fish understands that that's a, that's a fly, yeah. right? Like it understands it's a lure. And one thing that I've seen with the midges, at least out here, um, is that you don't necessarily get that same feedback yeah. from fish, which gives me a lot of confidence in them. Um, again, getting them to eat is a different story, but not getting them to spook is almost a skill, a, a skill in and of itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just yeah. as, as effectively presenting is so. I mean, that's, I think that's really, you know, especially, you know, especially for a lot of people who make the transition from spin casting to fly fishing specifically for salmonids, you know, I think that's something that gets missed a lot, you know, especially, you know, people who, who have, who have spent a long time throwing inline spinners and stuff like that are used, used to that ag aggressive kind of engagement that a moving pattern on spinning gear will elicit. I think that's, that's really a formative understanding. I think, um, you know, really with salmon is in general is that, is that engagement is half the battle. I mean, there, I mean, it depends on the size of the fish. It depends on the species you're talking, but obviously like, you know, a lot of, most of these individuals are not chasing prey down, you know, they're operating within feeding windows when they're feeding and really not veering outside of those. And obviously expending as little energy as possible within those windows you know, so, you know, catching the fish is not all the success and not all the win, right? Like, not it's also rejected is the first win you have in, in a series of wins. You know what I mean? Not getting what? Not getting rejected. You know what I mean? Because exactly as you absolutely. said, I mean, that's absolutely, that's, I, I think people, you know, I think the other thing too is, is like people, it, it's also a skill set that comes with it, which is having the ability to decipher rejection. You know, I think a good example is, you know, Tom Rosenbauer in the, in the Orbis Guide to Fly Fishing. And this is obviously kind of entry level, but, you know, something he really harps on is, is you know, 
to, the vibe that I get is that Tom Rosenbauer doesn't really throw the same pattern after a rejection that many times. Um, but I think you and I both know that there are exceptions to that. I think that's, of course, that's, I think the real skill in recognizing that comes when you have the ability to recognize permanent rejection <laughs> versus temporary rejection and, yep. you know, yep. stuff like that. Yeah. Sure. And I think it's such a key to it also is like, is I, I kind of see these things on a spectrum, right? Like when you first walk up to a spot before you put a, before you put a fly in front of, in the water, before you've casted a shadow on the water, before the fish have had any chance to detect you, you're kind of in the middle of the bar graph, right? And the bar graph extends one side is like positive engagement and one side is negative engagement. And I think so many people only think about getting onto the positive side they don't think about avoiding the negative side. Yeah. And it's like just as much a battle to avoid negative interaction as it is to create positive interaction. Yeah. So I see this on the plat all the time. I see guys, um, you know, and this is, this isn't to take away from anybody. It's, you know, different people have different philosophies. I see a lot of guys power fishing, um, Euro nymph setups. They're very effective. I see them catch a lot of fish, but they're also kind of, you know, they're walking through a lot of the feeding lanes, yeah, totally. right? They're not giving, they're not, they're not stopping to spot fish and possibly trying to see which fish, which fish are in feeding lanes, which fish are cycling through, right? Where are these fish in their feeding cycles, all that kind of stuff. That's personally how I like to fish. Again, there are different, more than one way to skin a cat, but it's always something that I kind of wonder is like, you know, with a lot of these guys that I see power fishing a little bit more, it's the second you get in the water and you, you start power fishing that, that Euro rig and, and really like getting up into these spots, you're, you're creating, you're, you're sliding onto the negative side of this. Yeah. When you throw shadows on the water, when you're clicking gravel with your boots, you know what I mean? When you're making, you know, more you know, constant presentations and all this kind of stuff. Again, totally. there are people who do this effectively. There are exceptions to the rule. I'm not saying that urine nipping is bad. I'm not saying that wading through, you know, deep water and river is bad. It's just, I think for a lot of people more on the intermediate range of things, they're so focused on creating the positive that they forget about avoiding the negative. Yeah. I was saying this to a guy that I met at the fly shop the other day. I don't see anybody butt scooting on that river. I don't see anybody crawling on that river. And to me, it's like, I, I'm, I am obsessive about not throwing shadows yeah. onto water. When I first pull up, I am obsessive about not letting fish see me when I first pull up to a spot, because when I first pull up to a spot, a lot of times on the, on the, on the plat, especially up in the Canyon, um, in those deeper holes, you get fish holding all throughout the hole. And if you walk up kind of willy nilly, you're spooking fish off the flat. You're walking up to straight out the gate. Yeah. And can you catch fish out of that hole again? Absolutely. You can, but are you automatically on the negative side of the scale if a 16 inch rainbow just ran horizontally through an entire pool that has 20 fish in it? Yes, you are. Yeah. Like you're automatically, you know, putting yourself on the back foot. So it's something that I, that. yeah. And I like that too. And I think the thing, I think, you know, to even go further with it too, I think what some, you know, it's, it's a, it's a lack of awareness that that spectrum exists. And I like the idea of that spectrum which is how we always, Max and I are, are, I don't know if Max, either Max or I are, is even fluent in English. I think we're just fluent in analogies, honestly. Yes. How we yes. But, you know, we talk a lot about spectrums, you know, the general spectrum of mastery within fishing, all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, I like that here, that it is a spectrum and there is, you know, there is kind of a, a an opposite side of the axis here. And I think what's also getting missed in that too, is the fact that recognizing the bad and avoiding the bad is as much of a, as as much of a developed skill set as the opposite. It's not 100%. just, it's not just like, Oh, you learn how to be good and you know how to look for, and then the other things just fall in. It's like, no, you fail and you look at the wrong things and you cast the wrong shadows and you move too quickly and all this shit, you know, and that, that's skill building. That's not, I think that's something people miss fishing bad not fishing bad as a skill, you know, that's hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's just as important of a skill as fishing. Good. Exactly. And that's the, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's, that is on the head there. 
Um, so yeah, anyway, kind of kind of rambling here. I have a basic, uh, I, I, I swear to you, I, as you know, I, Tom Rosenbauer, if by the grace of God you're watching this, I love you, just know that. Um, and in Tom Rosenbauer's style, I have, I have literally, the last, because again, this is our first, this is my first fishing interview also, so I wanted to do it right, and I, I've been listening to the Orvis podcast for like, obviously for you, forever, but you know, for days on end, straight here, um, trying to pick Tom's brain about how to do this, so I, you'll, you'll see my eyes glance to the left here, and that's because I am rocking a cheat sheet, cheat sheet provided by Mr. Rosenbauer, so... If you're wondering, that's what that is. Anyway, um, so we do actually have a, a a bit of a a bit of a topic of discussion today. I promise we won't really just ramble about our our individual fisheries and what we hate and love about them. But um, yeah, I guess if you're ready, I mean, we'll just we'll kind of get into our topic of conversation here. And I guess sure. I kind of smoothed over some intros and stuff here. So again, this is Max Boshin. Uh, Max and I went to college together, actually, here in Western Mass, and we graduated together in 2017 um since we graduated i've actually been here i'm still in western mass now and guiding here and all that kind of stuff as you know but max has actually kind of been all over like sort of everywhere and everywhere in between you were in north carolina uh, back home max is originally from north carolina back home after graduating then was down in florida um now out in colorado with max's partner michelle um so yeah, I mean, obviously, Max gave you a little bit of a spiel there about what he's mostly fishing. Mo I mean, like, you know, for us out here in Western Mass, I mean, obviously, we all know, you know, you have your big names, like the Deerfield and the Swift and the Farmington, all that stuff. So Max's equivalent, as he said, for that is is the South Platte. But obviously, there is, I mean, that's one of that is one of the the fish catching capitals of the world. So there's obviously a lot of other water. A lot, a lot of options out here. A lot of options. A lot of options. But, you know, in terms of the big name, the world famous, it's the South Platte. And that's obviously, you know, as everything freezes the salad out there. That's what we've been doing all winter. Yeah. Um, so give me one sec here. Um, very ready. Very ready for new water, though. We're almost there. And the uh, the South Platte, as much as I love it and as as much as it has taught me, I am I am definitely ready to, to get away from it. Yeah. <laughs> Spread it as Oh my God, I'm so ready. So it's exciting. It is worth it. that. Anyway, that. Um, so today we're just going to, I mean, honestly, um, you know, there's a reason that Max is the guest today. I, uh, I've known Max for a very long time. I've fished with Max for a very long time. I've also fished with a lot of people in my life. Um, bit of background about myself because I, this is my first video and I've not given it. It is, it is your myself. first video. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually originally from Chicago, the Chicago area. Um, so grew up uh, South Wisconsin tributaries. Um, I was on the amateur bass tour for like my entire high school experience and all that kind of stuff. Um, very much grew up in the kind of like great lakes spinning, spinning and uh, casting tackle tradition, a little bit of center pin stuff here and there. Um, so that's kind of my, my two cents. I've kind of, you know, my interests is in terms of fish have sort of just carried over, <laughs> carried over in Massachusetts, you know, yeah. grew up catching bass and trout and pike and all that stuff and still doing that now. But yeah. Um, and he showed up. He showed up to Western Massachusetts freshman year with a bunch of fire tiger deep divers, and he said, hey, man, "This is the way. This is the way. I'll teach you how to bass fish." Oh yeah, that was, the water was the water was not so green in the, uh, in the <laughs> streams of New England, believe it or not. Uh, oh god. But yeah, so we're. I mean, honestly, the uh, the thought today and why, and you'll you'll see Max a good amount, and I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I I'm I'm dogging Max every day to. Uh, to sign as sign on as a 1099 guide and uh go for it out there but you know teach their own <laughs> it's it's gonna it's gonna happen it's gonna happen. It's gonna, gonna happen it's gonna happen it's gonna happen and that's sort of the point right so that's the point of the conversation today uh max is you know kind of gonna go the rosenbauer style you know kind of kind of give max a little bit of background room here and just talk about a little bit where he's coming from on an angling in life you know philosophy stuff conservation philosophy fishing philosophy um, and the real thing here, I mean, I really think why this is going to be so valuable for you, the listener, and also, especially for you younger listeners, is Max is in that hunt. And Max has been in that hunt for a very long time. I am fortunate to have kind of made it to that point, finally, you know what I mean, through a lot of luck and hard work and all that stuff. Um, and Max is like on that same path. And I think at the end of the day, 
I think so many of us in fishing at this point, especially the younger of us kind of below that generation X and, you know, and younger than that, so many of us randomly, like in, you know, in the age of the internet, want to be fishing pros again. Um, you know, I think that's, that's guy, kind of, you know, you look around you and anyone who takes this seriously enough will tell you that they would have a dream of being a guy at some point. Um, obviously that is true of Max as well as he said. Um, so I think what's really valuable here um, is that a Max has a massive amount of experience in fishing. Max has been fishing for over 20 years. He's also fished, you know, in a much greater diversity of fisheries and a much greater diversity of fish than I think a lot of people have, you know, obviously he grew up in North Carolina, redfish country, trout country, you know, Spanish mackerel, Albi, stuff like that, you know, then moved up to New England, obviously land of brook trout, smallmouth, all that kind of stuff down to Florida, you know, kind of similar to, and see obviously with the, you know, addition of tarpon and that kind of stuff, you know, and now inshore saltwater stuff, inshore Still saltwater. inshore saltwater stuff. Yeah. And now this massive jump, you know, to, you know, you want to compare, you want to struggle to compare two fisheries. I think trying to compare South Florida or set whatever, you know, central Florida to, uh, Gulf Colorado coast, was, Northern, Northern Gulf coast, Northern Gulf coast, Northern Gulf coast to Colorado is probably, that's a far cry. Uh, it's different. So that's kind of, you know, a, that's kind of what I'm thinking in terms of, of really what Max is given here is that Max has seen a lot of fisheries and fished for a lot of different kinds of fish. I think the cross of the line, and as I continue to cross this line out here, having grown up in a landlocked area, living in Massachusetts now, um, people who can catch fish in saltwater and freshwater are people you should always listen to as anglers. Like that's just my two cents for all of you. Um, those who know how to catch fish in both fresh and salt really understand fishing at a really deep level because they're very different <laughs> from each other. They are very different. Um, and as I continue to catch, struggle to catch saltwater fish, I really <laughs> continue to like realize that more and more. Um, the other thing is, and I don't, I don't want to make Max blush too hard right now. Um, and I know Max wouldn't say this about himself. So I'll say it for him is that I, Max will work harder than you as, uh, for those of you who want to be guides, Max will work much harder than you, he, than you will. I um, mean, he will maintain a vision better than you will. And this is not a, this, I'm sure you're good. You're a great angler. You work your ass off. Max will work harder. So that's the other that. thing here is this is, this is resource that's coming from somebody who's got the right head on their shoulders, who's got a plan and is going to reach it. Um, so for those of you who want to help pull out pen and paper, now would be the time to do <laughs> Um, so yeah, so without further ado, without, you know, let's just background it to death and then we'll never even ask a question, but, um, so Max, if you could just give us, you know, give us a little bit of an idea, I, you know, I, I'm interested in going chronologically here, you know, before we get to yep. the prescriptive stuff. So you can just give us an idea, you know, where you started in fishing and, and, you know, how it progressed. Yeah. So, um, fishing has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember, which is honestly a bit strange because my family are not really outdoors people, at least not my immediate family. Um, so I was, Kevin said, I, I'm from North Carolina. I do consider myself from North Carolina. I was born in um, New York in sort of like the Poughkeepsie area. Um, I lived there for the first six or seven years of my life. So I have vague memories of um, sort of like my formative fishing experiences being at my grandparents' house. Um, you know, they had a, a, sort of quintessential Northeastern United States Creek running through the backyard, um, caught smallmouth out of there, caught trout out of there, caught panfish out of there, just kind of standard stuff. Um, I think it was one of those things where I, I was the first grandchild out of my family. Um, so I think it was, you know, everybody wanted to spend time with me, right? So like my grandpa would bring me down there, my great uncle would bring me down there. Um, I don't think it was ever thought of as something, you know, anything more than just a pastime kind of deal and to entertain me, but obviously it, it grabbed me pretty hard. Um, and then when I moved to North Carolina, um, fishing kind of on and off, um, I surfed a lot growing up, skateboarded a lot growing up. That was kind of like my main hobbies and all that kind of got back into fishing. I want to say like junior year of high school, I started fishing. I mean, I was fishing all through it, but I started fishing regularly kind of on a daily, you know, couple times a week type basis. And that's when I really started cutting my teeth on, uh, fishing artificials, learning how to, fish. I was also, I was never really into soaking bait off the beach and catching, you know, whiting and pompano and croaker and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I did it, but it never 
grabbed my attention like fishing with artificials did. And where I'm from North Carolina, there's a big inshore flounder fishery. Um, it's kind of decimated at this point, but when I was growing up, it was still going pretty strong. So uh, my formative, like less basic fishing experiences were walking the bank of snow's cut with three 16 pounds jig heads and gulp shrimp um, jigging for flounder um, on high tide on flats. And that's when I first kind of started finding success on those patterns, you know, patterns that I was cultivating myself that I found interesting and entertaining and all that. Um, and sort of like quickly afterwards, um, sort of different side of my life. I've worked restaurants my whole life. My mom, my sister both work restaurants. Um, and my, my mom was working at a restaurant on the beach, um, that we're from that's like on the marina or whatever. So I went back there summer, first summer after college and, um, through that, you know, it was, it was on the marina where all the, all the charter boats would come in through that. I met a lot of the guys that were mating and captaining those boats and my mom being the awesome person that she is kind of forced myself, forced me to introduce myself to these people. And I ended up getting a mating job on the head boat in, you know, go out of that marina doing, you know, big party boat, bottom fishing kind of stuff, um, out in the, the Gulf stream, frying pan tower, um, that kind of area, if you guys are, are familiar with that area. Um, and that's when I really started when fishing first became like a viable career path to me in my mind and something that I really wanted to do. Um, cause I've always had a strong sense of like poser is the wrong word. I think this comes from skateboarding and surfing really. Um, you see in the surfing community, you see so many people living on the beach, growing up on the beach. And it's funny. Cause you, you said, we always talk in analogies, right? So here is the first analogy for my, <laughs> my story, but, um, growing up on the beach, I surf year round. All of my friends surf year round. We were very good at surfing. Like I served competitions when I was growing up. I didn't win. I didn't lose. I was middle of the pack, but like, I was good enough to place. Yeah. I was good enough to like make it through heats. Again, I'm not going to sit here and say I should have been sponsored. I was, but like, if you saw me surfing on the beach, you'd be like, Hey, that guy knows what he's doing. I could carry it myself. The thing that always stuck out to me about surfing culture is like, you would get during the summer, you know, obviously during the spring, fall, winter, the beach is a lot less people on it. Right. And then during the summer it gets very touristy population of my town would balloon tenfold right and you get all these people on the beach who you can tell their identity when they go home for the rest of the year is i am a surfer right like especially with like high school kids right they go home and it's like because they go surf for two weeks out of the year three weeks out of the year they get to go home and like wear their fucking board shorts around pardon my language um and and be like hey like i'm a surfer guy right me being there all year long, I watch somebody like that surf and I'm just like, that dude has no idea what he's doing. Yeah. Right. And it was always interesting, like skating, surfing, you meet people, even people from there, you know, people from North Carolina, from the beach who you would meet at school. Oh my God, I skate all the time. Blah, 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 blah. You go skate with them. And it's like, you don't skate. No, you've ridden a long <laughs> up and down the beach. And there's look, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Like everybody is allowed to be what they are, but it always got under my skin. People who tried to like, put on an identity that yeah. they weren't. And in the fishing thing, when I worked on that head boat, it was the first time that I was around guys that were like really lifers, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like a glamorous thing. It wasn't like they, they enjoyed fishing so much that they became a guide. And now they, you know, are doing technical sight fishing stuff with people. Like these were, these were blue collar dudes working a blue collar job that just happened to be fishing related. Yeah. Right. Cause that's what they fell into. And I have always had a strong sense of like, if you want to, if you want to really do something, you can look at the guys who, you know, are really doing it. And they all are, they all have a very similar lifestyle. They all do the, they all have the same schedule. They all do the same things. And it's kind of like, you're either doing that or you're not. Yeah. And that was, again, that, that experience was sort of the first time where I was like, Hey, I can kind of start to understand what it takes to be legitimately good at this. You know what I mean? And for the charter stuff, what it took to be legitimately good at that, 
was, you know, we didn't see this on the head boat, but I would see this just being around the dock, cleaning fish, talking to other captains, stuff like that. You guys who were really good, if they weren't on a trip, they were out diving mm-hmm. on wrecks, trying to figure out like where grouper were holding on this peach structure. You know what I mean? Like there's a different level of commitment among people that, that really do this. Um, that again, once you're around it in a professional sense, you, you really see, even among the professionals, the one Yeti did this amazing video, uh, like short little documentary thing called, I think it's called like 90 days or something. It's on the tarpon fishery in, um, Northern Florida. And I forget the name of the guy that they, they feature, but just absolutely obsessive tarpon guy. And they have another guide who works the same area talking about him. And he says, and it's always stuck with me because it, it encapsulates what I'm trying to say here. He was like, look, you can take a client out to a spot that you already know, and you can catch a fish there and fill out that client. And that makes you a guide. It doesn't make you a fisherman, Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't make you an angler. Like what makes you an angler is going out and trying to recondition, trying to find new spots, trying to be better every single time that you go out, like being better for yourself and being better than everybody else around you. And I'm not, I'm not very competitive when it comes to fishing, but I do have a strong sense of, I want to work harder than everybody else. Like I want to be on the river longer. I want to be the first car in the parking lot. I want to be the last car to leave on Monday. I was the only car on the plat. I mean, I sat there for four hours in 50 mile an hour winds in a snowstorm to essentially get a two hour window before it and a half hour window after it. You know what I mean? I feel that very strongly because again, I watched a lot of guys do that. Um, you know, not just, And honestly, I've watched like a lot of guys do that, not really for the love, but just for the money, because that was their job. And that's, that's what they were doing. You know what I mean? A lot of the, a lot of the, the, the mates that I worked on with the headboat, I mean, they loved fishing. They really did. But like, I mean, they were pulling commercial nets on that boat in the off season and they were doing that kind of work. You know what I mean? And they ain't doing that for the love. Right. But they're still spending time. They're putting in the work. And again, that was the first time that I was really exposed to people who were, you know, it wasn't just a job. It was a lifestyle kind of thing. Yeah. And it really like set me on a direction with this whole thing. Um, I did that for a summer and pretty much that summer was that boat ran twice a week. So I was working both days out of the week. And if we had any trips that were like sort of light on people, um, we would kind of like draw straws to see who would get to fish on those trips. Yeah, yeah. So I caught a lot of, I caught a lot of good fish off that boat, a lot of big grouper, a lot of big amberjacks, stuff like that. Um, during that, during that summer. Um, and then it was, um, you know, around through college, it was, um, you know, it was tough up in Massachusetts. Like, I feel like I didn't, like, I definitely didn't know what I was doing up there. Um, I feel like even for you, it kind of took you a long time to figure out exactly what's going on out there and like what we should be focusing on. But the first, um, the first fishery that I felt like I, I really unlocked and kind of mastered, not mastered, but like had good success on as an adult was probably the smallmouth fishery on Bobbin. Um, and that was super foreign, foreign to me before going up there. Um, but super fun fish to catch super different kind of place obviously limited access there as well because of the bank fishing stuff yeah. um because we didn't we didn't have a boat up there at that time but that was definitely formative in the um like cultivating a pattern sort of vibe totally. right like fishing different baits at different times like we fished that spot the you know that area i don't want to say the name of it without saying the name of it but you know um still trying to protect me out here (laughs) yeah i mean and especially from the bank you know what i mean that like there was not a lot of people doing what we did out there some of the fish that we caught off that spot like i don't know if that necessarily needs to get burned yeah um but we caught a lot of fish a lot of a lot of different ways there right like we caught fish on top water we caught pre-spawn spawn spawn, post-spawn um and that was definitely like a big learning experience like picking apart essentially 300 yards of bank um, throughout a spring season and finding success on a lot of different conditions, a lot of different patterns. 
um, that definitely stuck with me for a long time. And it was hard to leave that, yeah. I will say, because it was sort of the first one. And, you know, not to ramble too long. Like, I, I want to come to a stopping point oh, here at it. some point. Okay. But I think, so, to kind of speed through it a little bit, and then I'll get to the through line. After Hampshire, um, or after Massachusetts, like, like what Kevin said, I went back to North Carolina, kind of messed around, fishing a little bit. Um, kind of, that's where I met Jim, um, started fishing with him, kind of like my main mentor, um, on the saltwater stuff and a lot of just like, and kind of that first guide, stuff. like guide guide, like yep. non-charter, you know, like, yep. Single and guy. definitely conservation minded, you know what I mean? Like focused on fishing artificials, all that yeah, kind of stuff. A- yeah. So after so after North Carolina, like again, I met Jim. I was fishing there. Nothing earth shattering. No, like nothing new. Just fun fishing. Um, I moved down to Florida, and I lived kind of landlocked in Florida for two or three months. Then I moved to Tallahassee, and that was when like moving to Tallahassee was really when I started becoming the angler that I am today. I would say, and kind of like really got on the path that I am today. Um, because I got there, it became very clear very quickly that I was not going to fish there if I didn't have a boat of some kind. Like there just wasn't bank access that was close enough that I could regularly try to, like that I could try to cultivate home water. It was going to be an hour, hour 15 drive just to get down to the coast yeah. and then to try to find weightable water, walkable water, good bank access. Like it was just untenable to try to cultivate some kind of home water down there. So I got myself a kayak and pretty much what I did. And I would, I mean, something that we could go into maybe a little later or maybe on a different episode or something. It's just like how to cultivate new water and how to cultivate home water. Because I think that's a skill that I've really built up over the past couple of years, moving around to all these places. Um, But we, um, once I got down there, essentially what I did was I spent, a couple of days, maybe a week, um, on Google earth, spending a lot of time just picking apart, um, areas within probably an hour and a half of me. And my mentality was, I want to find a launch or a series of launches that are close enough to each other that I can kind of like pick a square mile, pick a square two miles. Yeah. And that was just going to be my spot. And I was getting until I was convinced that I had made the wrong decision essentially like I was just going to go out of that that launch or those two launches and just fish that stuff yeah. and just start trying to build some kind of home water some kind of some kind of local knowledge um and luckily the area that I picked down there ended up being really productive for me um the kayak the area that I that I picked it was a it was a bay that was connected to kind of two different marsh systems one of which was drastically better than the other and then sort of out of the mouth of the bay there was a system of oyster farms and just these giant sprawling grass flats that kind of like the gulf is weird like it's kind of hard to tell where the inshore water ends and the gulf begins because it's not really an ocean so it's like you get to this area you get to these areas where it's like these sprawling grass flats that just go out for a mile and a half and it's all just three to five feet deep potholy kind of stuff you yeah. know so i spent a lot of time in those marshes for reds i spent a lot of time on those grass flats for trout speckled trout um and i spent you know a little bit of time doing the big black drum thing um while i was down there and I'll again put, it was um, just... i'll put a picture of those of those blacks too if i can yeah at least yeah. you know maybe maybe i'll drop something on instagram you know on the N- npa instagram and just maybe that'll be the maybe that'll be the pick yep those giants <laughs> yeah yeah those, those ugly guys um but yeah no i mean that was that time was very formative for me because it was the first time i was really alone i didn't ha- i wasn't at home i couldn't ask people questions really um i was really just picking spots off google maps and then going and trying them on different tide cycles and stuff like that yeah. And I found a lot of success out there. I mean, I caught a lot of reds. I caught a lot of trout. Um, I feel like that's when I really got good at fishing for reds was in that area. Um, it was also just a really 
it's really rare to find unpressured inshore fisheries. And that was just a uniquely unpressured inshore fishery compared to a lot of the other places that I've been, um, which was just nice and very, forg- I mean, redfish are forgiving fish to begin with, but they, it made them even more forgiving as somebody who was, you know, I hesitate to say still learning, but like getting better, you know, getting, getting good at what I was doing. And yeah, I did that for about a year. Um, at the tail end of that year, I bought that John boat, little, like a 14 foot John boat. Um, I ran that, uh, out of Tallahassee. Um, the Panacea was the actual area that I was fishing. If anybody's curious, um, I ran that John out of Panacea for like a month or two. And then I ended up moving to Jacksonville, um, which was, I mean, just a totally different, totally different, um, fishery insane amounts of pressure i mean that, that is that is the busiest water i've ever been on by yeah. far bar none um that was the st john's right that was st john yeah the greater st john area um but the thing you know i hesitate to be like i'm gonna give a lesson or i'm gonna give a because it still feels weird to be like i know things yeah that <laughs> other people don't but like one thing that i can do that i really can say is Although the, although on paper, the Jacksonville fishery was completely different than the Panacea fishery, I approached it exactly the same way, mm. which is I went on Google Earth, I found spots that I thought, like I found a system, I guess is a better way to put it, a marsh system yeah. that I thought looked good and kind of had all the puzzle pieces that I look for in those systems. And I was just like, boom, okay, that's my home water. Like I just decided before I yeah. went out there, you know what I mean? And we talk about it a lot. I am huge on eliminating variables when it comes to fishing. And it's just a, it's a constant mindset that I have. And in saltwater, I've talked about this to you. Saltwater, the biggest battle in saltwater is finding fish. Like in freshwater on these trout streams, the the fish are there. You can see them. You can go look at the same fish every single day. They're still there. Like there, there is the 22 inch brown trout that continues to elude you sitting in the same spot. He's always there. The interesting thing about saltwater is they're not always there. Like, yeah. They move around a lot. Um, so finding fish is the hard part. My mentality then always was let's eliminate that variable, right? It's very easy to get caught up just burning gas on saltwater in your boat, going from spot to spot, to spot, to spot, to spot, and not just spot to spot, but like system to system to system to system. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been on many boats that have burned, I mean, 40 miles a day inshore. I mean, Jim and I have done that many times. Yeah. Um, trying to figure it out. And for me, always in, like in Jacksonville, I was only there for three months. My mentality was I'm just eliminating that variable. I'm going to the same system every single time. doesn't mean I'm fishing the same spots every single time, but I'm going to the same general area every single time. Yeah. Um, and what that does is, you know, generally there are going to be fish in all these areas. Um, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to start learning a place. Right. And the key to all of, I mean, the key to all this stuff, the key to finding fish really is knowing the systems that you're fishing and you can't know them unless you spend time on them. Yeah. So that's something that, you know, it worked really well in Tallahassee, worked really well in Jacksonville. I found great success in Jacksonville on the redfish um, in, I mean, super pressured water, super pressured. And I did really well out there on, on reds really just because of that reason, because I chose, chose an area, spent all of my time there, learned, pretty quickly sort of the ins and outs of what was going on in that area, you know, how the tide moved in and out, where it seemed like fish like the stage, where the bait was holding on low tide, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and it just, it just ups your learning curve instead of, you know, going out, getting skunked one day, and then you go back to the drawing board and you start from a blank slate yeah. again. I see people make that mistake all the time. And it's just like, you don't have to start just because you get skunked one time. Doesn't mean you have to start yeah. from a blank slate. You know what I mean? Um, well, it brings up an interesting also, I don't know if I thought I discovered this just tangentially. If you just saw me do that, I didn't. I saw somebody else do it. I don't even remember who it was in the tying demo. If you are not threading your bobbin by just sucking on the end of it, and if you oh, have please, a yes. tool to thread it, you don't need to tell us. You don't need to be embarrassed. Throw it away or have it return. Suck it through, baby. Suck, Suck it, through. it through. Anyway, the interesting thing about that that I think is really interesting too, because Max and I, you know, as both of us have you know, our advanced, our more advanced, you know, have found our home water, you know, Max often 
you know, really hones in for me is, you know, and obviously third party advice is, is some of the most valuable things in the world. Also, you know, third party advice is much clearer than your own perspective. 100%. You know, and Matt, you know, Max's prod for me often is, you know, as I'm getting set my ways or my mindset's off, you know, Max will really harp on new water, new water, new water, new water. Here's the thing, because I think a lot of people have that idea and it's a good idea. I think the issue is, is that you earn your way to that. You have to have a home water before yep, yep. you're pushing for this new water or else you're kind yep. of spinning your wheels, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that hundred percent. Um, so kind of exactly what you were saying. I mean, you weren't going to go and try to noodle every single creek because the first one didn't work. You were going to go back to that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, no. I hear what you're saying hundred percent. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, um, that's a mistake a lot of people make. And again, this is, I would take a, I, fresh water and salt water is different. Like salt water, I would discourage people from trying to fish new water until they get to a certain point. Because again, so much of the battle on salt water is finding fish to begin with. You have to learn how to find fish. Like, and when you're learning how to find fish, shrink the area you're trying to find them in, right? Instead of looking at a map, looking at Jacksonville in the greater Jacksonville area and being like, I've got the same, at, you know, I've got the marsh at St. Augustine. I've got the marsh of St. John's. I've got all the tributaries of the St. John's. Oh my God, where am I going to pick a tributary? Yeah. Pick a marsh, pick a square mile and just be like, this is where I'm going to learn how to find fish in. You know what I mean? Especially because you That's, don't, you don't know enough. There's no point in getting into that. Like, well, which is the best one? Because you don't know anyway, too, you know? Exactly. Like, exactly. Exactly. And you have no criteria to judge it by. Exactly. You know what I mean? So so yeah, I did, um, after Jacksonville, I went back to North Carolina with the boat for the first time. Um, had a really great summer in North Carolina. Took a lot of the same principles oh, yeah, from dude. down there big, and big flats applied that it. summer, right? Like crazy flats that summer. Yeah, big flounder. Um, really just consistent redfish too, which is hard there. Um, not saying that there aren't people who do it, but it's, it's, it's one thing to go catch redfish on bait certain times of year. It's another thing to go consistently sight fish redfish there throughout the spring, summer, and fall. Totally. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I was able to do that. Um, I was able to catch some, some speckled trout in North Carolina during the summer, which I was pretty proud of because they're just a fish that I've never fully understood. Never really had the time to not, I mean, not that I suck at it, but it's just, they're a tough fish. Um, especially in warmer months. So it was cool. We have some success doing that. Yeah. And then after that, I moved out here. Um, last year, I started the year last year um, in the spring, spin fishing for pike at some of the bigger um, reservoirs here in Colorado, just because it was the most similar to what I had done. And it was also, I already had the equipment for it. Like it just easy crossover. I caught one in like half a dozen trips out there. Pretty brutal. Uh, moved a lot of big fish, but only caught one. Um, and then started picking up the fly rod and just slowly um, working my way into the fly world. And we, you know, trying to take the same lessons that I learned from, you know, eliminating water, eliminating variables, picking things and sticking to it. Um, my whole attitude last year was I'm going to fish one fly and I'm just going to eliminate that because the fly stuff that seemed to be the most confusing to me was, you know, you walk into a fly shop for the first time, especially out here. And there are literally 150 different flies to choose from. And if you don't come from a freshwater background or a trout background, you know, or a fly fishing background, it's just like, I mean, you just look around and you're like, what are we doing here? Yeah. So I pretty much, I, I would say 98% of the cast, 99% of the casts that I made last year on a fly rod were elk hair caddises in 14 to 16, pretty much. Um, and yeah, in December of this past year, I kind of looked around. I wasn't really fishing that much during the fall when the winter came. And I was kind of looking forward to this season and I knew I, you know, I really wanted this, this season that we're about to get into to kind of be my prove it year on a lot of the fly fishing stuff and the trout stuff. So in December, I pretty much just started going out to the plat two or three times a week and without really any expectation to catch fish. I wasn't trying to catch fish. 
just learning how to nymph, trying different rigs, trying different baits, looking at bugs, flipping rocks, just like starting the process of yeah. learning. Um, once I figured, once I thought I was, um, you know, proficient enough in the nymphing stuff, I started going to Cheeseman Canyon because there were fish to be had there more so than around the Deckers area and like the Waterton Canyon area. So started going up to Cheeseman, broke off a lot of fish. I've adjusted some stuff, got some new equipment, start, and then started landing fish. And it's kind of been, it's kind of been on from there. Um, yeah. Really falling in love with the fly tying thing. That's been a huge part of this whole journey out here, I guess. Um, and now, I mean, honestly, like I'm, I'm in so much better of a place for this coming season than I thought I was going to be out here. Um, that I'm really just like excited for it to get going because I spent a lot of time up in Cheeseman, which for people who don't know, it's super clear water. I mean, just, I, I described it, Kevin, there's just no dirt in that Canyon. Like it is, it is clear. It is clear after a spring rain kind of thing. Um, you can see every fish in that river. It's just very technical sight fishing kind of stuff. Um, it's very hard. And just these, you know, past week, I started going back down to Deckers again, and I've just been finding success pretty much immediately off the bat down there. And it just seems like that work that I put in at Cheeseman for two months is like really paying off. Yeah. So, um, well, it also yeah. got compounded by the fact because it wasn't, you know, and it's worth it to say too, you know, it's, it, you did it right. Like you took it slow on the fly, you know, cause you had the, you know, you had bought into this equipment when you were still in Florida. Cause I remember you. Yeah, I started, I started, I, I got my first, I I got, given a fly rod that I used, I guess the first fish that I caught on the fly was in um, the fall when I was in Tallahassee because in the fall speckled trout school up and they're, they're pretty dumb. If you can find the right size class in the right size school, they'll kind of eat anything. So um, I was kind of strategic about it and I waited for that to happen um, to kind of take my first fly cast. And I caught a speckled trout or two on the fly. I mean, you could have caught them on any, I mean, you could have took a six-year-old out there and caught them on a, a Zebco. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's nothing to brag about, but yeah, no, I've been, before I moved out here, I was playing with it. I was yeah. playing with it in anticipation for coming out here. Um, and then, I mean, we've talked about this a lot of last year for me coming from the East coast, was just getting comfortable in the mountain West yeah, camping, backpacking, all that kind of stuff, building up that skill set. Um, which I don't regret at all, but it was definitely less fishing focused yeah. this year is going to be really the, the fishing focused year out here. Now that I've got all the sort of like requis requisite skills to, yeah. to be effective out in the mountains. Um, I think that kind of brings us maybe to nice looking caddis. Um, nice looking caddis. I'm like bopping around here. I literally, so I've tied it as we've been sitting here, just a brief update. I've had an ESL, a beadhead caddis larva, a steely rainbow warrior, and four brassies. No, nice. three brassies. Um, nice. I mean, honestly, like for in my opinion, I mean, we're really, you know, and appreciate the background that really gives us a good idea. Um, you know, really, what I was thinking, you know, as we were planning this, and and why, you know, why I'm hoping that people, you know, especially those of you who are still in high school or younger, or whatever it is, you know, who who have aspirations that lie in a similar field as Max and I, I'm really hoping you're taking notes here because it's the, it's the right person to take notes from. Um, but that kind of brings me, I guess, to my main point. Cause like I said, I mean, I, you know, you, I, uh, there's a lot of things that go into being a good angler. There's a lot of reasons that somebody may or may not be a good guide in their life. Um, working one's ass off is certainly probably, probably more pertinent than being good. I would say. Uh, 100%. 100%. I, I mean, not even fishing. I mean, I, I went to, I went to college with Max. I mean, we studied together. I, I tell you right now, like this, you know, you have those people. I mean, it's like, it's, it's the, um, it's the mama mentality thing. It's the Kobe Bryant thing, right? Like that's what everyone said about Kobe Bryant was that he would work harder than you. You might be good. You might even have a better jumper. You might have whatever, you know, but he's going to work harder than you. And therefore he's going to be better than you. So that's kind of what yeah. I'm thinking here. I think what you just said there, you're like, you know, well, I didn't fish that much. You know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm hoping you can, you know, talk a little bit more just about like your philosophy and your work mindset and like yeah. putting a vision together and staying to it. Because I think 
that's even the perfect example, right? For most of us, it's like, oh, we want to go do something. We want to get good at something. And we kind of just try to jump in, you know, and we kind of just try to do it, um, which is fine. You're not that person. I've watched you not be that person for a very long time. Like you're the person who will literally take a year without even casting these rivers just to look at them. Like just to put yeah. that image in your mind, just to build that mental map. The, yeah. that's work ethic that's working your ass off like that's what working your ass off means so i don't know if you i don't know if you have anything especially like kind of thinking about like you know thinking about that 14 year old who might have that and thinks that they might have that who wants to be here yep. and where we are in 20 years and be doing it you know whatever yep um yeah i'll just kind of go on it because I, I do think about i i think about this stuff a lot yeah. and um there are days where i have to impose a little bit of self-discipline on myself you know what i mean and, and kind of there are days that i don't want to do some of the things that i do yeah um but kind of two sides of this to me to me kind of two parts of the philosophy that that come together to create what i what i do one side is you can't skip steps on this stuff like you have to in my mind you have to start from the beginning and work your way up um and then the other side to this is sort of just like a no days off mentality. And I'll kind of talk about them both separately. And, and I think when you combine them, you, you create a recipe for success, right? So I, I'll start with the no days off thing just because I think it's simpler and it's easier to understand for people. But when I say no days off, like I, I mean it. Like I said it to Michelle, my partner the other day, like a week ago. Um, we were just talking and talking about future and blah, 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 blah. And I said to her, I was just like, look, I know as long as I, if I do something fishing related every day this year, when January one of next year comes around, I'm going to be in a good spot to do what I want to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. That's fishing related every day. I don't know, you know, how that looks or how that fleshes out. Maybe it's a lot of fly tying. Maybe it's a lot of scouting. Maybe it's a lot of me being on on X hunt maps, looking at backcountry lakes. You know what I mean? But I, like I said, it is easier said than done, right? It is very easy to be like, I'm going to do something related to my path. And look, you can relate this to any passion. Take fishing out of the equation, yeah, right? Totally, totally. It's, it's very easy to say, I'm going to do something related to X every day um, because, I, because I love it, blah, 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 blah. It will become work at some point right? Like it will become a grind at some point. You will not want to do it at some point. And for me, the important thing is when you come to those points, if you want to be a hobbyist and you want it to be fun and you want to enjoy it, then listen to that voice. Mm. If you want to be a professional, you have to override that voice. Mm. Wow. Right. So like, to me, like fishing is not fun. Like it is, but it isn't. Right. Yeah. Like I very much see fishing as work. I say it at work a lot. I say I work harder on my off days than I do at work yeah. because I do like, this is another mindset that I have about work. I say all the time, whatever time I'm giving to work during a day, I'm giving that same amount of time to my passion during the day. Work does not get more than my passion does. Mm -hmm. Right. Just for my own mental health, for Hear my own that. mental well being. write that down, write that down. That's the one you write down right there. Yeah. And it, I mean, look, we could talk about this for personal stuff. You know what I mean? Like I, I think about a lot for cleaning, how I keep my house, all that kind of, like, if I'm going to sit here, I'm going to wait tables. I'm going to make everybody's tables. Perfect. So I, I work fine dining stuff. If I'm going to make everybody's tables perfect, I'm going to wash my own dishes at home. Right. Like guests don't get better treatment than I treat myself. Mm. Work doesn't get more time than I give to myself. Right. I think about that all the time. I mean, I work, 3 30 in the afternoon to 11 o'clock at night, pretty much every day. I wake up at eight o'clock in the morning. I am doing fishing related stuff from probably nine or 10 o'clock until three. Yeah. Like whether it's tying flies, looking at maps, going fishing. I mean, I fish a lot, but you know, I've worked a lot of closing shifts where I get home at midnight, go to sleep, wake up at five 30, go to the plat back by two to work at three 30 there till 11. Right. Cause again, in my mind, work is not getting more than I get for myself. Um, so yeah, it, it, like I said, it's, it's one thing to be like, I'm going to do something every day. I'm going to work hard at this. It's another thing to really like put your money where your mouth is and treat it like a job. Yeah. Right. Totally. Um, and I would say if I was to give advice to somebody who wants to do this and 
really, I'm just giving you the advice that I give myself, right? Or like the things that I tell myself, it's before it's a job, you got to treat it like a job. Like you got to prove to yourself that you can treat it like a job. Um, And like I said, to me, treating it like a job is, it's not a, it's not a mindset. It's not a, I think about it in a certain way, or I'm planning to do it in a certain way. It is time in and that's it. Like what you were saying earlier about, you know, your camera roll, the proof is kind of in the pudding. Yeah. Like to me, time on the water is everything. How many days did you spend on the water this year? Like, that's kind of all I want to know about people Yeah. when it comes to angling. Like my goal this year is 150 days on the water. Like, and I'm pretty much on pace to make that happen. And I work a full-time job and I have a relationship. Like that's kind of as much as you can do without it being your job. I think and it. the reason why I didn't fish so much last year is because I knew the kind of fishing that I wanted to do this year which is a lot of backcountry stuff, a lot of alpine stuff. Once it gets to be summertime, I didn't have the skill set to do that. Totally. Right? Totally. So I spent last year building the skill set to do it. Did I still fish a little bit? Absolutely. It's not like I didn't fish at all. Pause but there. Too, I didn't fish. That's, that's part of this, man. That's part of working hard, right? Because that's that yes. pause there. Like in that, I think it's worth it to highlight that as a part of your philosophy and a part of why you are successful. Because it's also about self-awareness, man. It's about honesty, right? You weren't, you weren't ready to do those 15 mile round trips to 15,000 feet. You weren't. And it's yeah. foolish to think you are right. I think so many of us, it's fine. And all it's, it's an ego thing and it's a masculinity thing. We all know that. Right. But it's like, that is, that I think is one, one of the most valuable things right there, you know, like have the awareness yeah. to know when you need to put the work in, you need to treat it like a job because yeah. you're not at the point of just walking up to it yet. Yep. Yeah. And look, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to get all like, I don't know how best to say this. I just keep coming back to, there is no substitute for time in like whatever it is that you do. I say this to you all the time, just because you watch a YouTube video doesn't mean you know anything. Yeah. In fact, if you watch a YouTube video on a certain technique or blah, 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 honestly, a lot of times you kind of know less because you think you know something and you make a plan around thinking that you know something and inevitably, it happens to all of us. Every time we learn a new technique of YouTube, every time we go to a new spot that we, that we found off Google Maps, whatever it is, whenever you walk up to the spot, whenever you make those first casts with that new presentation, there are variables that you will, that you will come across that are unforeseen, right? You don't know that, like, for example, you watch a video on nymphing with a wool indicator, right? It all looks simple. It all looks easy. It's another thing to really dial a wool indicator system for a place like Cheeseman Canyon, where you're fishing a lot of really fast water, a lot of plunge pools. It's, it's difficult to get that right combination of weight to wool to what flies are you using to get the right presentation. It took me probably three weeks to figure out how to present right in there. And, then, and that's, you know, two trips a week kind of thing. So it took me half a dozen trips to figure it out for, for real. I think what happens to a lot of people is they buy a new rod, they buy a new reel, they buy a box of flies, they buy new waders, they buy new boots, they do all this stuff. And it's all kind of gearing up to this pinnacle of like, I'm going to go to this, you know, this destination trip to the plat, you know, to Cheeseman Canyon, whatever, dream stream. And you build and you build and you build and you build and you've built all this expectation because mm-hmm. you see the, the success that people have. You see how they have the success. They teach you how to have the success in your mind. You know, I've got the key. I've got the answers to the test when I go down there. Yeah. We all know though, that it is harder than that. Right. And it just takes time on the water to figure this stuff out. So I, I, what I've always trying to do by starting from, and I'm kind of moving into the starting from the beginning mindset Yeah. is I'm always trying to prevent myself from like setting myself up for failure. Like you you never want to build expectations in your mind that you can't, um, you can't meet on these bodies of water. Cause that's when this stuff starts to get really discouraging. Yeah. So my expectations are always low and I always assume that I don't know things, right? Like I always go down assuming that I don't have the answers. I need to figure it out. I'm not the best angler on the river. I can learn from everybody out there. You know what I mean? And when you work from that, that angle, it's, it's a slow learning process. It's can be a frustrating learning process, but it's very thorough. You don't have any gaps 
in your knowledge. You know what I mean? Like you don't have any variables that you can't account for because you haven't, when you, when you, when you take knowledge, I'm going to keep using the YouTube videos as an example. I feel like that's how everybody learns now. It's like YouTube videos don't allow you to skip steps. Like just because you get a technique, you know what I mean? And it's a quote unquote, like advanced level technique. Just because you learn one advanced level technique from a YouTube video that you can go and use with a little bit of success doesn't mean you're an advanced level angler. Yeah. You know what I mean? What me, what, what, what an advanced level angler really is, is somebody who's just stared at fish for 10,000 hours. You know what I mean? And I would rather talk to somebody who stares at fish 200 days out of the year and maybe fishes seven of those days than somebody who goes and fishes, you know, 50, 75 days out of the year, sort of like your, your, you know, high level weekend warrior yeah. type. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess to kind of wrap it on and allow you to speak again and, and ask more questions and steer the, steer the conversation a little bit. Like to me, it's all about starting from the beginning. It's all about being thorough and it's all about not skipping steps. Like none of us know enough to skip steps when we yeah. start out as beginners, whatever you're doing, whether it's a new technique, whether it's a new body of water, whether it's a new species, like, I mean, I'm a damn good sight caster. Like I, I, I'm really good at catching redfish, right? Does that mean that I can come in and be cocky about catching trout in fresh water? Absolutely not. Right. It's totally different. Yeah. Um, and it's easy to, it's easy to see how it's different between redfish and trout. But I think the hard part is carrying that same mentality between redfish in Panacea versus redfish in Jacksonville versus redfish in North Carolina. Right. Like I still approached every single one the same way. Yeah. We just start from the beginning, looking at maps, picking areas, fishing those areas on every tide cycle, on every lunar cycle, and then making decisions about those areas. Right. It's not going out there once and being like, well, it doesn't look like the place that I had success on in Panacea. So I'm gonna, yeah. now going to go try it. It's just trust in the process. Always just find the process that works. Trust it yeah. to the end. And look, my way is not the perfect way. My way works for me. Um, and I understand, I mean, first of all, not most people are not insane like I am and they don't have the time to spend on this and they, they like going out. They like having friends. They like partying and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't. So <laughs> that, that affords me like a, a big luxury in, in this field. But, um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's keeping that, that beginner mentality sort of wherever you go and, and understanding that, you know, in my mind, until you've spent a season on a body of water, you are a beginner. Yeah. And, and, and think about what spending a season really means. A lot of people, it takes them five years to spend a season on a body of water right? To effectively fish spring, summer, fall, winter, and really get a vibe for what a body of water is yeah. on spring, summer, fall, winter. That can take people four or five years to do that on a body of water. And until you, until you have that, you're a beginner. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, it should be treated as such, no matter how much advanced level knowledge is coming at you from YouTube, Instagram, all these other places. Yeah. And on a more philosophical level, this is the thing that I've always loved about the outdoors. This is the thing that I've loved about fishing. This is the thing that I really love about the mountains, backpacking, all that, that kind of stuff is like, I didn't come from a great economic situation growing up. One of the things that's always bothered me growing up around saltwater is it's very much a money game to get into. Um, like you either have the boat to fish offshore or you don't like, you cannot go fish for King Macro on a John boat. You cannot fish. For, I guess you can fish for King Macro on a kayak kind of weirdly you can launch it from the beach, but like you need a certain amount of money to like go catch a tuna. You need a certain amount of money to go catch a grouper. Like there's just, there's no ifs, ands or buts about it. Like this kind of stuff is so democratizing because it's just how hard are you willing to work? Like how much time are you willing to put in? You know what I mean? Like we're all, we're all pretty much the same when it comes to our mental capacity to understand fish. It's not like anybody's born understanding fish innately more than anybody else really right um obviously like i guess you could argue some people are more coordinated than others you can cast a fly rod a little better than other people but like really we're all starting from the same place with this stuff so the only reason you look at a guy like you know pat dorsey on the plat the reason he has a name the name that he has is because i could probably guarantee you he has spent the most time on that river out of literally anybody 
in the past 50 years. Point blank, period. No argument. You know what I mean? Like there's one guy who's had his feet in that water more than anybody else. It's that guy. That's it. Like at the end of the day, that's what separates him from everybody else. Like Landon Meyer on the dream stream. The reason why I know that dude's name is because he's probably spent more time there over the past decade than anybody else point blank period. And if he hasn't, he's top five, right? Same with Dorsey. It's like, if, if he's not the guy, he's top five, top 10. And it's just like the, the mathematics are not that complicated. The formula is not that complicated. It's just, are you, are you willing to spend more time than everybody else or not? Yeah. At least that's what it comes down to for me. That again, this is just what I tell myself all the time with, with this is like two or three years from now, I'm going to start guiding. There are going to be a lot of other people that year who start guiding for the first time. The only thing that I, I can't control them. I can't control the clients that come to me. I can't control whether or not the fish bite. All I can, can control is I've spent more time preparing for this on the body of water that I'm trying to guide on than anybody else coming into the market that year. That's the only thing I can control. So I'm going to control it. And I'm going to make sure that I am the person who has spent the most time on that body of water over the past two to three yeah. years. And it's just like, at that point, again, you have the answers to the test, right? Because at the end of the day, there are no shortcuts. There is no technique that you're going to learn that's going to put you over. I mean, dude, the thing that, that um, one of the things that stands out to me a lot about really successful guides is how readily they give away all their information yeah, because totally. they know it doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter because it's about fishing conditions and it's about fishing. It's being adaptable. It's not about having spots. It's not about having patterns or the right lure or the right size of lure or the right color. Right. It's about having enough experience on a body of water to be able to put it together on that day on those conditions. So like, you know, I love Jay Watkins um, down in, I think he's in, in um, Texas, the guy who does the, the speckled trout, like walkthroughs on the, on the bow. Dorsey's the same way on the South Black. I mean, he'll just he'll just post the pictures of his trip from that day. This is what we were using. You know where he's fishing, like or at least within two miles, three miles, you know where he's fishing. You know exactly what he was using. And it's kind of just the confidence of like, yeah, I figured it out today. It's going to be different tomorrow. It's going to be different the day after that. And I'm going to keep figuring it out day after day after day yeah. because I've spent more time than you here. So yeah, I don't give a shit if you know what I use today. I don't give a shit if you know exactly what I used, where I used it. Because that's not what it's about, right? Yeah. Like it's about being able to figure it out on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, it's just something that sticks with me all the time. The better, the more, when you get to these like master guys, the guys who've been in business for 20 years, 25 years, they're just given all of it away. They're given all their information away and they're still more successful than anybody else. Yeah. What do they have that everybody else doesn't have? It's not information. It's not technique or technology or whatever. It's just time. They just put more time in than anybody else. This is, here's an example I'll use. North Carolina, um, a big, a big, and th this is true of any coastal fishery. I, a lot of your, your charter business um, during the summertime is uh, like near shore reef and wreck fishing, like one to three miles um, off the coast kind of stuff. Because you can do it in a bay boat, you know, which is what a lot of coastal guides are running, uh, you know, 22 to 24 foot stuff that you can kind of, you know, best of both worlds. You can fish inshore with it. You can fish the near shore stuff with it. You know, take poor people, that kind of vibe. Um, in North Carolina, they have a lot of artificial wrecks and artificial reefs off the coast. Yeah. Um, they're all public knowledge. There's a map of them on the North Carolina, like wildlife website. Right. And they're dotted all over the place. There's tons of them. Um, off the top of my head in the Wilmington area, which is where I'm from, there are two, main like you know most known reefs off Wrightsville Beach there's the Liberty Ship off um Carolina Beach there's the Marriott Wreck um I would say 70 per 60 to 70 percent of the guides running bay boats on any given summer day are on either of those two wrecks there are I mean forget about finding your own structure out there with I mean fuck man they they, they the Civil War was was fought off of our coast. There are yeah. hundreds of shipwrecks out there, hundreds that are uncharted. You could just go to the NOAA, the NOAA website, or the, the, the North Carolina Wildlife website. There's 20 other artificial wrecks on the 
on the the website that wow. you could go fish. You know what I mean? Within a similar striking distance, similar, right? Um, and yet you still find pretty much everybody with a commercial license out on these same terrain because it's just it's what works. It's known, right? When the speckled trout start running in the fall, you see literally 20 guide boats, I mean, not 20, that's, that's a bit excessive, maybe, you know, eight to 10 guide boats lined up on the same bank of the Carolina beach inlet, because it's where they come in from when they, when they come in from the ocean during the fall, there's a big deep trough there. They like to school up there. When it become when we get that first cold snap, you'll literally, you'll just see a dozen boats there. You know what I mean? All yeah. lined up. Half of them got commercial licenses with clients on. And it's just like, man, like you're doing same spot, same time of year, same fish every single time. It's just like you're complacent. You know what I mean? Mm. And that might work for older people, like older guides that have established client bases because they're going to the same spots and da da da. da. But if you're a young guy trying to break in, you cannot be on those holes. You don't have that luxury. You just don't. You don't. You don't. Because one, you're giving off the impression to a client that you don't know what the fuck you're, I mean, you're, you're bringing to a community hole and it's clear that you're bringing them to a community hole because guess what? You look around, there's the entire community. Yeah. You can see the light <laughs> in their eyes standing yeah. around. Right. <laughs> um, and I mean, not for nothing, the guides who've been out there for 20 years who have cultivated those spots and originally found them or those spots were passed down. Like they are the reason that those are community holes. Yeah. Right. So they get a little bit of say and they get to take guys there, but you know, for me, if I was trying to break in on North Carolina, I said, I used to say this to Jim all the time. If I was going to guide in North Carolina for the near shore stuff, I would literally, I would just spend a summer out on my boat, um, offshore with a light line off the back, just to entertain myself, to see if anything came up and smacked it. Yeah. And I just, I would just be going out there and I would be coming off. I would be turning my, turning my outboard off. And I would just be sitting there on my leaning post, just staring at my graph, just drifting aimlessly yeah. for two or three months. Just going out there, drifting around, drifting around, drifting around. You find half a dozen spots in two or three months doing that. And you've built an entire business. Entire business. Yeah, no, exactly. You, you know, know what I mean? Like, it, and people are just, again, it's just time, time, time. And hey, one thing I will say on the time front, because um, I, I didn't, we didn't really get to this part of the conversation. I never really mentioned it. Um, but if you want to take this serious, like if you want to take this seriously and you want to be a little bit more than a hobbyist, you want to go down the guiding route, you got to be spending time on the water without fishing. Yeah. Like it's so key. Like you got to be going down to places with no expectation of catching fish with really no expectation of even throwing a line. Right. I mean, I'm not saying burn an eight hour day out somewhere without fishing, but like when you walk up to spots, like you should really be spending five to 10 minutes watching what's happening, especially if you've got good sunlight, clear water. You know, and what I mean by spending five to 10 minutes, I don't mean you walk up and for a minute and a half, you look and you start casting at, instead of casting at the first fish you see, maybe you cast at the third fish you see. I'm saying, look at your watch and spend five to 10 minutes just looking at a spot. Yeah. Because you might think you're spending five to 10 minutes. You're really spending a minute and a half. You know what I mean? And the difference between spending five or 10 minutes at a spot and spending a minute and a half is when you spend five or 10 minutes, you'll see that brown that's on its feeding cycle that was deep when you walked up and then slides up onto the gravel shelf for 30 seconds and then slides back down and then slides up two minutes later for 30 seconds. That's what you'll see when you sit there. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Um, and I just think that that's so key. I, I know I told this to you, like when you're scouting new water, you shouldn't be freaking fish. It's like, it's a tournament mentality. Yeah. You know, like you go scout new water, especially small water for, for places that you want to take clients. You shouldn't be catching those fish. Yeah. And that was, I mean, you, we all know, and that was, you know, he's specifically talking, you know, for us New Englanders, obviously we know them as, as blue lines or CFRs. I'm going to be entertaining business in the CFRs. And that's definitely where I've cut my teeth over the last decade or so out here. Um, but what Max is saying is, you know, we all know how those CFRs work. Most of them are, you know, at most a few miles long. Um, and especially for those wild fish, I mean, they're, you know, some of my favorites, I've caught the same individuals literally half a dozen times over the years. And that's beautiful. It's a moment, it's a memento for catch and release, but it's not, you know, what Max is saying here is, you know, the smaller your water as a guide, the less fish you should be catching on your own without a, a client with you with a rod in their hand. <laughs> 100%. 
hundred percent. So I guess I don't, we're like running so long here. I do want to clip it at some point, I guess the only other thing. So I, I, I hope this has been helpful. I really do. And I, I say again, I mean, and I think Max said it and that's not a daunting. I mean, and this is the thing. It's, it's a small world, right? It's a, it's a community. And at the end of the day, we're all here to support each other. You know, I've had guides in this area reach out to me and be very supportive. I am not competitive about this stuff. I, I, I really want to say that. I know I said a couple of things about like, this is what I'm doing, blah, blah, blah. Actually, I, when it comes to meeting people and, and people on the water, I am really, I'm not competitive with it. And I, I don't think there's really any, any reason to, any reason to it is, it is a community. One thing about Kelly Gallup that's unique is a more, maybe more so than any other tire I've seen Kelly Gallup knows the reasons of what he's doing perhaps better than anybody else. And he has, yeah. failed he has failed more to know how to be successful than anyone and, and just to reiterate because he spent so much time doing it because he put the time Again, it comes down to the time thing just to reiterate that point and i think so i think that because i think the time of this is the practical the time of this is the praxis if you will it's actually putting boots on the ground and actually doing this stuff and of course, there's another side of that coin. There's the mindset, right? There's the, how are you thinking about this? How are you philosophizing this and preparing for this and evolving with it over time as you start to build and do this practical kind of stuff? Um, so I think that's like, that's kind of what I'm interested in for you because that's also something I think you just excel in. Like you're not a person who kind of, you don't fly by the seat of your pants. Like you move with intentionality, you move with a plan, right? Yeah. So I guess, you know, if you have any thoughts just about like, how do you make that come together? How do you make that two year? I'm going to be a guide in two years. How does that become real? Well, I, first of all, I'm not a guide, so I don't know how it becomes real. I have a idea of how I am going to make it real. Um, and, and I guess even to further context, you know, and I guess for the, those who are older than 16, those who are in college or maybe recently graduated who are have jobs that are not in fishing right now, because maybe that's it too. Like how, you know, as somebody who's working other than serving fish at your restaurant, you know, you're working very far away from the angling industry right now, obviously, but keeping this, this concrete mindset, it's never out of your vision. You know, I think what you said about, about compartmentalizing time, you know, I'm, I'm going to give as much to myself as I do to my job. I think that's a, a big key to this, but you know, yeah. I guess even more of that, like I, maybe if it's even less for the kid in high school, because unfortunately for the kid in high school, you just got to graduate high school and then you can become a guide. But yeah. I guess maybe for more, you know, closer to our, our age group, you know, for those who are currently waiting tables, but want to be a guide in two years, you know, what's that yeah. mindset? Like what's that preparation? What's that planning look like? Um, so first and foremost, like we've talked about this before, you can't sacrifice, you can't sacrifice your family for this stuff. Like I'm, we're both super lucky to have, partners that are like absurdly supportive of what we do and really put up with a lot and I mean I wouldn't be able to invest the time that I invest without that you wouldn't be able to invest the time that you invest without that like it's such an important part of this um on that front something that I it was actually Steve Ranella meat eater um I remember like really early on in his podcast he was talking to somebody who was like recently married or like getting engaged or something like that. And he talked about how he always tried to be like authentically himself from the beginning of his relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get into what you're saying, but I think this no, is like a, a crucial part of it. You yeah. know what I mean? Don't lie to the people around you about what you're trying to do and who you're trying to be. Right. You have to be honest about this stuff and you have to like set expectations early or else when you do try, because again, you're get it's just such a time commitment. Like, I, I know I keep beating a dead horse with this, but there's really just no substitute for putting time in. And by well, putting how, time many, in, how many adult, fully adult anglers do you know around you in your life? And this is no judgment, but who have been divorced multiple times, you know, this kind of stuff. Because for I sure. Know a hell of for a sure. And if they haven't, right, they're not fishing over 100 days a year. They're probably not fishing over 75 days a year. Or your, so wife, is, or your wife or husband is Amelia or Eric Jensen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, that's a super hard balance to strike. And like, before I say everything that I'm going to say, I'm just prefacing it because I'm, I'm pretty much going to tell you to sacrifice your life for a couple of <laughs> years. That's, that's where we're going with this. And, um, what, but what I'm going to say before that is like, you can't, you can't sacrifice everything, right? Like you can't get too tunnel visioned. Like I said, we talk about this a lot. 
and the people that are in our lives put up with a lot and we are both super grateful for them because we wouldn't be doing the stuff that we're doing without that that being said like my mentality with this I'll start kind of high level and then I'll work my way down into like actual things that I do on a daily basis. Um, it kind of stops trying to philosophize and more get into the nitty gritty of like, how do I try to get better? Like what techniques do I use? Um, first and foremost, you got to trust the process. Like all this stuff that we've been talking about, about putting the time in, sorry. Yeah. Um, all this stuff that we've been talking about, putting the time in, um, being consistent, um, really working, on booby did you even grab me a long phone charger okay um yeah you, it's all about trusting the process like for me right and for me the process is like i said earlier i'm spending time doing this every single day um that looks different on different days like right now it's a lot of fly tying um what it is not, I will say, it is not watching YouTube videos. That is something I've totally gotten away from. Um, and I really don't watch technique videos anymore unless I feel like I really can't figure out something on myself. Like, unless I feel like I really get to an area where I've, I've worked through all the techniques that I have to kind of tweak a presentation, tweak, tweak a technique, and I'm still just not getting what I'm supposed to be getting. And I feel like I should be able to, or I've seen other people do it, then maybe I'll thank you then maybe I'll look something up, but I do not, do not think that listening, listening to somebody talk about a technique, learning about a technique on YouTube is not part of the process to me. And I just want to say that from the beginning, because to me, part of the process, the process is doing stuff. It's tying flies or boots in the water. You know what I mean? Like that's what counts as quote unquote, the process really kind of nothing else. Um, cause you're either doing it or you're not. Um, and when I talk about, you know, the time that you're putting in and one second, I'm going to duck under my desk and plug this in so that I don't have my phone die on me. Cause that would just be so tragic. And that's an interesting philosophy thing too. Cause I actually, I come and Max and I know that about each other. I actually come from the exact opposite philosophy. You know, it's, uh, like when I started fly fishing, I literally sat on the Orbis guide to fly fishing for however 40 many hours of, of content that they have on there you know what i mean yep and and you're not necessarily wrong to do that right yeah. like it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing i the thing that makes me nervous about it is again i just don't want to pretend like to me it it's i don't want to pretend that that means i know something and i know for my mm -hmm. for my inkling like i did this a lot on the boat with jim a couple summers ago like i i said before i'm not that great at catching speckled trout i watched a lot of videos on catching speckled trout and i used to just talk about how to catch speckled trout on that boat he's much better at catching speckled trout than i am and i would be the one sitting there talking about it because i was the one watching all these videos thinking that i knew stuff so it's about striking a balance if you can do it without thinking that it means you're an expert or you know something that you don't know that's totally fine for me I got away from it for that reason. Cause I found myself kind of thinking that I, thinking I knew things that I didn't necessarily know because you don't know it until you've actually done it. And you have a little bit of experience working through it. Um, so again, yeah, it's, it's, it's about time every is, day. Just to cut you off briefly. I think that's an interesting prescription too. And I think a good recommendation, especially for a, a beginner, especially, you know, then this is something that we didn't say. You and I were very fortunate to be very, very, very good anglers for 20 years before we picked up fly fishing, which is a huge advantage. Um, a lot of people obviously pick up fly fishing off rip and they're starting from nothing with the most difficult technique in fishing, which is tough. And I think that's a really good piece of advice right there. And I hear that too. And like, for me, you know, me saying like, I sit there when I, when I started fly fishing, I watched the entire guy to fly fishing. I've been fishing for 20 years already. I had fished semi-professional yep. made money off of it so i had the ability to rectify that for the beginning i think what i think i think that's an amazing piece of advice right for making this plan and trying to formulate you can go on youtube there's great resources out there of course especially for fly tying demos i mean that's a, and that's a different field i mean you have to, you have to watch the demos that's yeah. a different thing but I think Max makes a great point. Watch that video. Fine. Watch that Kutzer double haul video. You know, watch the Rosenbauer Stillwater indicator video, whatever, but go practice it, man. That same day, 
because and, and here's the thing like if if you're a good ang- you know if you're a good angler and you understand how you want like an indicator a double nymph, a double nymph indicator rig to fish how you, you know you understand where you want it in the water column you understand sort of what current seams you want it to be riding in you're gonna learn how to mend you don't need to watch totally. a video on how to mend right if you want to put a cast in a certain place and you have a little bit of background and I mean, if you're starting from square one, it's a different thing, but that's not really who we're talking to. Here. Yeah. It's like, you don't need to learn how to do all these different casting techniques in a vacuum. You're going to figure out how to put the fly where you want to put the fly. Like you're going to figure it out. So instead of trying to get it perfect before you go out to the mm. water, just trust in your ability a little bit to figure it out while you're on the water. Right. And here's another thing that I think about a lot and, and something that I'll talk about here, just mentality wise, more nitty gritty, how I pick apart spots and how I think about fishing. Um, especially on these trout streams where again, like the fish are there and they're kind of always there. Right. Um, less so with the saltwater thing where you're kind of always struggling to find fish. And then once you find the fish, then it's kind of putting together how to catch them on the trout streams. It's like, you know, you fish a hole, you know, those fish are going to be there again. I don't think about my time to effectively fish the hole is not the first time that I go there. Right. Like when I first walk up to a hole, I talk about this with, with Jeff, that guy that I fish with here. Um, I don't care if I spook fish when I walk up to a hole for the first time, I kind of want to spook fish the first time I walk up to a hole. That way I can see where all the fish are sitting. Right. And a lot of times I'll do this. Like if I fish a hole for the first time and I kind of pick it apart and I'm happy with how I fished it, I'll cast the shadow on it just to spook everything out of the deep water so I can see where they were all sitting in the deep water. I don't need to catch those fish today. I'll be back the next day and the day after that, or you know, a week, a month, but blah, 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 blah. Um, it's not an all or nothing thing on these freshwater patterns, especially in the trout streams. Like if you're going to the same hole half a dozen times in a row, eight times in a row, and you still haven't, you know, you're still spooking fish out of the hole, then that's where you got to start looking at yourself and being like, hey, I need to learn, but like I've walked up to so many places where it's like, I feel like I'm decent at reading water. Um, and I'll throw a cast at a fish and I'll just kind of like not re- make the right mend or I'll, I'll line over an eddy that I didn't really recognize. And you just don't get a great drift on that fish the first time. And you kind of blew your shot and it's like, okay, but you didn't blow your shot because you're not just fishing that spot in a vacuum today. Now, when you go back the next day, you understand I need to stand you know, three feet to the right. I need to miss that eddy. I need to mend a little bit more downstream than upstream. And you can more effectively present to the fish the next time. So I always try to think about these spots as a multi-day learning process. Like it's not, each day does not exist in a vacuum. Like you don't have to be successful every single day, right? There's a, there's a guy on um, YouTube, lesser known YouTuber, um, LA fish blog, Louisiana fish blog. Um, he does very, very good speckled trout fishermen, like clinically good. Um, and he talks about always there's, there's finding trips and there's catching trips. And that's kind of where I, I ripped this from where he's so big on having dedicated scouting trips. And when you, when he would find fish and find success, he would, it, it wasn't about cleaning out the hole that day. It was about being able to go back on similar conditions, prepared to not have to figure it out to just be able to rip 75 trout out of a, out of a school. Mm. And he's the kind of guy who sit there with a golf counter. Like that's how many trout he's catching. <laughs> yeah. Trout again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's because again, it's, it's this mentality of it's not all about today. It's not all about finding success today. Right. Especially as guys, when we're with clients, it is about finding success today. When as guides though, when it's about finding success for a season, right. It's not about, whether we can go down there every single day and find fish for ourselves, spot fish for ourselves. It's about, can we put together a really good understanding of how this run functions in, in spring, Yeah. right? How this run functions in the summer, how this run fu- functions in the fall. That doesn't come from going down. The, and, and it takes a lot of pressure off yourself too, especially if you're new to this, where it's like, instead of going down there and beating myself up and being like, damn, you know, last outing that I went out on, I broke off two fish, landed one Brown. Um, but I fished some new water. I kind of looked at some water that, that spot that I caught all those Browns out of on scuds. 
I climbed like up an embankment and looked at it from like 20 feet down and really was able to see where they were and what they were doing and how that spot was working and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, now I can go back again and have a better understanding. And then I'll go back again and have a better understanding. And then eventually, eventually those fish are going to move out of that spot and I'll have a better, you know, I'll have to find them again and I'll have an understanding of where they moved and how far they moved. And it, it's building and it's building and it's building. And it's not about having success right now. It's about have, setting up success for tomorrow, yeah. which again, when I'm on the water is how I think about a lot of this stuff, right? It's not about, and look, it's not like I don't fish with urgency. I'm trying to figure it out every single day. I'm, I'm flipping rocks every day. I'm looking at hatches every day. I'm changing stuff up every day. I'm trying to put it together every day, but there's the like, there's the short-term goals and the long-term goals when it comes to understanding a river, understanding a spot. Right. And you can't, you can't lose the forest to the trees, right? Like you have to understand that all information is good information. Just because you're spooking fish, it doesn't mean you're not learning. If you go back and you spook the same fish over and over and over again, that's where you got to kind of look at yourself and be like, all right, I'm not learning right yeah. now. Right. But if you're spooking fish and then you go back and you understand how not to spook them, now you've caught those fish, right? Mm. You caught them by spooking them in a weird way. Um, so yeah, I think about that a lot. Three o'clock. Yeah, it's at it, the appointment is three thirty, but I, I'm gonna leave at three. We're, uh, we're 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 pushing our wire here for those who are watching. <laughs> yeah, I completely uh, I completely hear you. I think um, I think it's also interesting because I think it's a bit of a callback to what we said earlier, which is like bad fishing. Yeah, yeah. yeah um it's a similar callback to what we, max and i were talking about earlier which is like you know everyone wants to think about fishing well right and that you know that's how you build skill here is you learn how to fish well you learn how to be successful and it's it's like anything it's like you i think you less learn how to be good and you learn how to not be bad right and that you know what max is saying like this like you have to spend the time you have to invest the time to get the fish out right is exactly that like you have to be all right because what that is 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 that's that is the process of learning how to not be bad that is that is the process of skill building against poor angling right you're not necessarily skill building to be a good angler because you're not catching fish but you're skill building to not be a bad angler which is really important yeah. Yeah. um i think the other thing too exactly as you said like with the time thing i mean it, i think what's funny because as as you as you age and advance in angling, this word, word gets used less and less. But of course, when we're all starting out with bobbers, with Zebcos from docks, the word patience is constantly sown through angling. And I think it just becomes less and less of an idea because your mind advances so far beyond the idea of patience. But, you know, I have, you know, what, what very much has like given me visibility in this area. The reason that I'm able to guide this year, you know, is the fact that over the last several years, I've become very, very good at catching trophy broad trout in this area and have learned a massive amount about how to catch trophy broad trout in Western Massachusetts. I've had a lot of people reach out to me constantly after every single one of these fish. How do you do this? How do you do this? How do you do this? The first 10 pound brown trout that I caught in 2021, I encountered it for the first time on January 17th of 2021. And I caught it on June 4th. So key, man. I mean, it's, 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 it's the mentality that, that I learned at sight fish, fish and redfish, and I didn't have a certain moment or, or anything, but it redfish are really what, what did it for me. It's, it's constantly just telling yourself, just, just wait 10 seconds before you cast, mm. just give it another 10 seconds. Just give it hunting is big. It's big in, in this, right? Like let the squirrel poke his head out a little bit more let the rabbit take its last couple steps before it stops and turns around and looks at you. You know what I mean? Let that deer actually turn broadside instead of just quartering towards you. Right. Like it's always, I'm always telling myself this sight fishing for trout, same way. It's just like, man, like let him get back to where he's actually feeding. You know what I mean? Like just because you see him, like we all know like, Hey, that fish slipped off the back of that gravel bar for a little bit. He's not really up in that same spot that he was when I first walked back. But you really, everybody just wants to put 10 casts on that fish. Immediately. Yeah. I, I, I do it too. I mean, fuck, we all do it. But always you got to have that voice in your head that's just like, man, let him get back up get onto that bar where he wants yeah. to be. Let him get back into that current stream where he wants to be before you make that first cast. Just totally. because you can see him doesn't mean it's the time to make the cast. Yeah. Just because you're in a good spot doesn't mean the fish is in a good spot. Totally. So I do, it, it's, it's the key to all this. And trout. I mean, so much, especially on these pressured streams, you know what I mean? It is, 
it's really the difference between every, I mean, it, I see somebody, I see somebody walking towards a, uh, a, uh, one of these spots with the sun at their back, casting a shadow. And I'm just, I just discount them immediately. You know what I mean? It's just like, if you're, if you're casting a shadow on the water that you're fishing, if you're, um, not working from the back of the hole all the way up to the front of the hole, really methodically, totally. you know what I mean? Like, I just, it's just like, what are we, you're not taking it seriously. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I took, cause to me, taking it seriously means slowing down and understanding, you know, just because you spork, spooked a 14 inch rainbow that you didn't necessarily want to catch. It's affected your ability to catch the 22 inch rainbow that you did want to catch, yeah. whether you want to admit that or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and a lot of times it's the difference between getting down and crawling through a bush, you know what I mean? But sliding down some cliff or whatever and walking up on the hole, like everybody else walks up on the hole. It can be that simple. Yeah, you know and um yeah no it all goes in the same time one other thing because i have we're kind of getting towards the end i mean we've got like 30 more minutes but i just kind of want to anyway we don't want to we don't want to put people to sleep here oh yeah yeah (laughs) um but other other things that i'll say like technique wise and just again more like technical stuff that i always try to do kind of putting the philosophy into practice um for me i'm always trying to you know, kind of, like I said earlier, exhaust my natural ability to learn how, what I'm trying to learn how to do before I start looking for answers on it. And it's not to say that asking questions is bad. Like asking questions is awesome, but for my personal philosophy is like, I think a lot of us as anglers and just the the type of people that this sport sort of attracts or lifestyle, passion, whatever you want to call it attracts, we like figuring things out by ourselves. We like the challenge of figuring things out by, our, by ourselves. So even if I do get a good answer from somewhere or learn a good technique from somewhere, I'm still probably going to try all the stupid stuff that I have in my head that I think is going to work anyways. So I'm always kind of telling myself, just like get that out of the way, like just see if it works. Like all, all the things that I have floating around in my brain, I'm always just kind of like, yeah, just try it, try it, prove to yourself that it doesn't work or that it does work before I start seeking out all different kinds of knowledge. Cause again, eliminating variables. Like I just, I'd never want to walk down to the river with, you know, five rods and three different techniques that I'm trying to try. You know, I'm always kind of trying to stick to one thing as much as possible. Obviously I'm changing according to techniques, obviously, but I'm never changing for changing sake, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I never go down there to try a technique just because I want to, because it seems cool. Like I try to always go down, do stuff for a reason every time I'm down there. Um, which is again, like, I just think is super important. Um, I, I cannot overstate a big personal philosophy of mine. I, we don't really have the time to like get super into this, but something I say a lot on the river is I would rather frit fish an unpressured C spot than a pressured A spot. And I just carry that philosophy with me everywhere that I go. Um, and that can mean a lot of different things. Like that can mean finding bodies of water that people aren't fishing. It can also mean, I think I'm thinking of a specific pool in Cheeseman. Um, I will not name it because I don't want to give away my nice little spot here because they are, they're all named, but there's <laughs> a, there is a well-known pool uh, about three quarters of the way up Cheeseman Canyon um, that is nice and slow moving that holds a lot of very big fish in it. Um, and it's kind of like the last big juicy pool um, that you see before it, it's, it's the first big juicy pool you see for a while. And then it's the last one you see for a while. Mm. So when you walk up to it immediately and you see all these big fish on the bottom, you see these big fish, there's a certain gravel bar sort of at the tail end of it that a lot of big fish get up on. Um, and you see all these fish and immediately you want to start playing with them. There are off the back end, the tail riffle of that. There are two cuts in the tail riffle. I've caught rainbow. I've caught 18 to 20 inch rainbows out of those two tail cuts every single time I've gone out there. Um, and I, I literally think it's just because everybody fishes the, the deep water. Um, if they were, if those two tail cuts were by themselves as a run, they would get hit real hard. I think, um, especially in that section of river, but just because there's such a nice looking pool above it and there's honestly a really good run below it, they just kind of get overlooked. And it's like, even just like that, like you can find, I mean, you know, this, like, you can find, watch how your favorite community hole gets fished. 80 to 90% of the people fish it the same way. You can mm-hmm. find ways to fish spots 
that other people are fishing, a lot of other people are fishing in an unpressured way. Like even at in pressured spots, there are unpressured fish. That will make you a guide too. That's what makes you a guide. That's what, that's what makes you different and makes you marketable is the ability to present different knowledge and present different patternation from what everyone else is doing too. And also that's what, that's what creates, you know, that's kind of what is going to create a mystique around you and, and with clients, like, you know, you roll up to some of these pools on the South flat, you're kind of just going to have to fish them with two or three other people. And if you can be the one guy who rolls up, you know, snipes the one active fish that you know is in there and moves on everybody's kind of looking around like who the fuck is that? who's that guy right like that's how again unpressured sea spots regard that can mean a lot of things right just finding unpressured fish i guess is the best way to put it yeah versus f- fishing more obvious fish that are getting more pressure i take the yeah. unpressured fish any and put in the work to find the unpressured fish that's another thing that i'll say i in cheeseman um when I go fish that, that when I go fish the Canyon, I hike about three quarters of the way up before, like in the morning, I'm usually first or second. Uh, there's one guy who always beats me who I still haven't met before that I would like. <laughs> to meet. Um, I'm usually the, between the second and fifth car in there on a, on a Sunday or Monday. Um, well on a Sunday and a Monday, I'm usually the first person. Um, and I go straight up all the way up and then I work my way back. Why do I do that? Because everybody, I'm still fishing the same spots as everybody else. There are a lot of people who make it up that far, but everybody starts at the beginning and works Mm -hmm. their way up. So there's a point where I'm fishing all those fish first, and then I cross everybody, right? So even just thinking, I mean, in Cheeseman Canyon, all those fish are pressured. You really can't get away from it. I mean, you can get up higher and they are less pressured, but they are still very pressured fish. But the thing is, and I think this is personal philosophy stuff. A lot of those first pools, those fish are used to getting beat on in the morning. I think if you can be the one guy showing up an hour after the last person has put a fly in there and not cast the shadow, sneak up, identify your your catchable fish, make good, accurate presentations on them. Don't beat the water too much if they're not cooperating, right? You can kind of make those fish, they can fish like unpressured fish if you are kind of doing it the right way and allowing allowing for those opportunities if that makes sense Mm -hmm. um so i just highly encourage you fish different from people like just reflexively if you see other people doing it kind of automatically you should not want to do it right because either one of two things is happening either those people don't know what they're doing and you don't want to copy them or those people do know what you're doing do 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 know what they're doing and you don't want to fish behind them. either way you don't want to be fishing in the same spot as other people Again, at the same times or in the same manners. In a lot of places, it's unavoidable, but I think everybody gets what I'm saying. Um, in that vein, just to keep ranting, Google, you hear it everywhere. Google Earth is your friend. Like, use it, get to know it. I, I have moved to three areas now where I've just sterilely picked my home water off of Google Earth. You know, like I just decided this is the square mile that is now my home water by looking at it on Google Earth. It has not failed me. And I would highly recommend um, not just Google Earth, but like um, physical maps as well. And not just one physical map, but like multiple physical maps. So I have this, which has the South Flat. I have this, which has the South Flat. I have this, which has the South Flat. There are access roads that are on some maps that are not on others. There are things that are marked private on some that are not marked private on others. Just because one map says it does not mean that that is the truth. You know what I mean? Maybe it was the truth when that map was made. Get yourself a lot of different maps. I would highly encourage physical maps to make notes on. It's just also nice to have tactile stuff that you can open instead of scrolling around on your phone or on your computer, being able to hold it and play with it and look around and move it around and all that kind of stuff. It helps so much. And again, more is more with the maps, like as many as possible and compare them because it's really, I think through comparing them that you learn a lot mm. about the, cause again, if you can find, I, I, I've, I've got some spots around Colorado where I've got three maps that have this spot on it. Only one has an access road, right? So everybody else who bought those two maps don't understand that there's, there's an access road going to those places. 
like that doesn't exist nearly as much in the east but you get what i'm saying like exactly, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. find things through having different maps and different you know by by taking the amalgamation and putting it together you can learn a lot yeah. as opposed to just having your one map or your one map i mean even even google earth versus apple maps versus on x which are the three that i use on the computer there's different stuff on all that you know what i mean yeah, i mean there's there's rivers on on x, on x that aren't on google maps yeah you know what i mean and it's just pouring I mean, over that I knowing the best home ex- range in and out you got to know it all in and out yeah one of the i mean one of the best examples of that really just to like put a you know put a name to the face on that i mean we all know we all know we all have screenshots right in our phones of of this spot spot a from 2017 from that satellite scan that year and we screenshotted it and whatever and we saved it and you look at the 2019 scan of that and you could see contour you could see bottom transition you could get a rough gauge of depth you could get a rough gauge of staining or lack thereof from the 2017 scan the 2019 scan it's a completely different season shoot it's winter you know like that will even happen like you know I've literally lost like these beautiful pictures, you know, yep. screenshots and stuff that I've just gotten rid of. And I'm like, well, I'll screenshot it again. And I go back again. Guess what? That fishery's frozen. You know, or it's they, like. Or they, they took it on a windy day. Like this happened exactly. in North Carolina. Like one of my bays that I like to fish, they, they took a satellite photo on a windy day and it's all wind chop and you can't see where any of the oyster bars are. Exactly. Went. Whereas you could, for the past five years, you could see every oyster bar on that picture. And, um, and, and look, what that does for you with the, with the mapping stuff is it's, it's a substitute for time on the water. It's mm-hmm. one of the few things that substitutes time on the water, especially with the historical stuff and the comparison, you can get a vibe for how a fishery has changed and how an ecosystem has changed over time that you can't mm-hmm. get anywhere else besides spending time there. Yeah. So it, it is, it's a cheat code. That stuff is, a, it, it really can be a cheat code. Yeah. In a lot of ways. And again, more is more. Like you cannot spend, I mean, Michelle would tell you, you can't spend too much time looking at maps. I spent a lot of time looking at maps. And looking at the same maps of the same areas over and over and over again, because eventually things jump out at you. You know, it's, it's just, it's one of those things where it's, it's like you go fish a hole a dozen times. Eventually you're going to figure out that like, there's one boulder down there. That's a little bit bigger yeah, than the other. Yeah. And they really like sitting in front of that boulder. Yeah. You might not have realized that the first three or four times. Cause you were messing with other fish and other currents. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, well, I think also even, you know, to the conversation around professionalism and becoming a, becoming a pro, I think, you know, that's really important for the, for the aspiring guide too, because the thing it's like, it's like the idea of net that's, that's, that is the fishing ver- fishing guides version of networking, right. Professional networking, you know, for, for whatever a, a investment banker, I don't know, you know, they, you know, they, they get names, they get into phone numbers, they make uh, introductions and all this stuff. And it expands the realm of possibility. It expands this network that could potentially, you know, this one person that they met could potentially put them in the job that they'll be in for the rest of their life, all that kind of stuff. What Max is talking about, this kind of intensive reconnaissance, right? Like we're reconning before fishing, always recon before fishing, recon before going, recon before going. That's networking. Yeah. That's the that's the angler's networking. That's the guy's networking. Because the thing is, is if you do that, the more you do it, the more spots that can make or break having a guide business come in, right? It's, it's, yep. that's the idea of the network. That one person could put you in the job for the rest of your life. You know, that one spot that you spent the time on the Delorme map with and found could be the difference between starting a guide business this year and not. So, you know, something to consider. We should wrap here. I do just kind of want to I kind of just want to gist, you know, that last question that we had in the question, which essentially to Max was, and I think you answered it. I think we went a little tangential, but to sum it in, because I think you did answer it. The question was, you know, about uh, planning and, you know, as you're, as you're waiting tables and you want to be a guide in three years, you know, how are you, how are you staying in that mindset? How are you building towards that? Um, and I think what Max just said, I think there, I think rather, you know, that's not a clean answer. That's not a two sentence answer. I think if there's anything to just extrapolate what Max has said here and kind of you know, if you're taking notes to, you know, put this in your notes, I think there's words we can pull out, right. From what Max has said and from what we understand about how that process happens. I think the first word we all learned in patience that should come back. That I think we all forgot about is patience. I think it really is. I think biting your time and, and getting there is one of the most important things. And I think the directly in connected- multiple areas too. patience in the moment, patience for the day, Patience for the season, patience in the long term. Like mm-hmm. it, it, it's on multiple levels. Totally. Anymore. And that, and that is the same thing. Those are almost synonymous as trusting the process. If there's trusting yep. the process, I, that'll probably be what this 
episode is called, I think, because yep. that is the vibe here. Um, trust that process. If you got it, man, like you you do work that hard. You are that good. I'm talking to you, like the 16 year old, the 18 year old, the 25 year old who wants to do this. You are that good. You have worked that hard. You do know you're not there yet, but trust the process because you, as long as you trust it and you keep working like that and you put this Max Boshen work ethic in, you will get there. You will get yep. there. Um, I, I, I hate to, I hate to give a, a, a Tom Brady comparison twice in a row, <laughs> <Or> <laughs> twice, in, twice in one, one. Uh, they like that out here. I don't know. <laughs> thing. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> but um, if you watch his, uh, if you watch the mic'd up from not this last Super Bowl, but the Super Bowl before, um, there during the pregame he walks up to his receiver core and he just goes hey guys it's time to have, it's, it's time to go have fun out there we've already put in all the time we have all the answers to the test now it's just time to go do it and that's how i feel about about this whole business about fishing in general everybody has the answers to the test and the answers to the test is what you're talking about it's being patient it's trusting the process and it's putting in the time there are no shortcuts nobody that you see that you respect that is doing this on a high level has taken any shortcuts what they have done is they have sacrificed every other part of their life for a significant period of time. And they just grinded their little butts off on whatever body of water or whatever species they specialize in. And they poke their head up above water, you know, two decades after they started. And they were kind of like, wow, I'm one of the best out here doing this. You know, they didn't take any shortcuts. They were on the water 150 days, 200 days out of the year, every year. Yeah. That is the those, answer to the test. Those to are me, to me. When I think about me trying to set up and do this in two to three years, that is what I continue to tell myself is you have the answers. Do fishing related things every single day. Don't sacrifice your family. And obviously as many days out of the, on the water as humanly possible, um, whether it means being on, being out there on two or three hours of sleep, whether it means, you know, going after work for two hours before work for two hours, Whatever it is, there's no substitute for time on the water. As you know, I always say that. Um, and yeah, that's the answer. If, yeah. if, if you want to do this, or at least that, I, again, I'm talking as somebody who doesn't do this professionally, who really wants to do this professionally. This is the answer that I've come to. Talking to people, having done it a little bit in the past, really wanting to do it in the future, trying to set myself up to be successful in the future. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, you're it's right. Very, I mean, you know, and I mean, I'm looking ahead in my first season here with the company. I mean, I'll tell you right now. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's a, it, it is, it's, I mean, dude, I haven't fished in a long time and it's not because I haven't wanted to, it's because I can't, cause I've had to build a company, you know, and it's, it, it's, it's that kind of stuff, dude. It's like, you know, you put in the time, you put in the time this off season so that you could put in the time this year. You exactly. did that right. You know, you set yourself up to be able to not have to do this during the year, which was, smart because the last thing you want to do is be sitting in front of a computer trying to build a website when it's 85 degrees outside and they're on dry flies yeah. you know what i mean you can't be doing that so I, I i think you were smart about that and you made the right decision and still kevin you're doing fishing related stuff every single day yeah, yeah. just because you're not in the water you know when's the last time you just you went a whole day without doing something for the company or tying a fly or working on your casting or no, that's, never. I mean, there are no days off. That's years. There are, you know what I mean? There it's are no years. days off. This is a way of life. <laughs> it's a way of life. That maybe that's the one thing too, because you've talked a lot. And again, you know, and then we'll leave it at this, but you know, Max, obviously, as we've said here, you know, Max, Max's experience growing up was around guides was around charter mates and that kind of stuff. You know, and you've talked a lot about, you know, the ifs and ands of of the career guide and the guide who guides for one or two seasons you know what i mean yeah we have to um, you know and that's i that's that's it man like this is a way of life it is yeah it's it's so easy to oversimplify but every big guy in the world views this as a way of life every single one no exceptions <laughs> yep yeah all right, guys. I'll leave with a. I'll I'll leave with a little. Wait, no, Max, dude. You guys, Max just exited out. <laughs> I'll have to put him on the phone. This is gonna be so funny. <laughs> what the hell, man? <laughs>
Oh. Say bye before you leave. Oh. Yeah, no. Sorry about that. I, 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 I try to put my headphones in and it, it cut off the screen. But yeah, no, this was fun. Um, I, I, I said it a couple times in the, in the middle of this, but I just want to reiterate that, like, I am not a guide. I don't sit, I don't want to sit here and pretend that I have the answers to all of this. Really, all I was trying to present is my how I talk to myself about this. Um, and yeah, I mean, we'll see if it's going to be successful. Um, I hope that it will be. And I honestly, I mean, I look forward to doing more of these, like recording more of these, maybe just talking less about myself, getting more into the tying thing. Once, you know, spring comes for real, just kind of talking about what we're doing, talking about fishing, all of that. Um, yeah. No, yeah, I'll tell you right now, and I because you won't say it about yourself, so I'll say it about you. Um, again, I I, I, ho- I hope you got the vibe here because I, I hope I've had this in my friendship with Max for a very long time. I've had a lot of points with Max where I have felt a uh, fire being lit under my ass because of Max's attitude and work ethic. And I hope Max is going to say, I don't know if this is going to work out as somebody who is looking into my first guiding season. I will go ahead and call myself a guide now. He will be your competition in two or three years. So I hope you took notes. <laughs> oh, God. All right, we'll dude. Be nice about it, though. We'll be nice. We'll be nice. We're, we're all community, right? Share territories. All right, man. All right. Appreciate you. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Peace. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here again. I am super appreciative for your support. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to take you as clients to be producing content for you in the coming year. Um, you know, we'll have a lot of stuff rolling out here. We have merchandise coming out. Max is going to be tying some flies for us. You'll see those on the website. I'm going to be tying some flies. A couple other people throughout the country, actually, who are going to be tying some flies. Um, we got a lot of exciting stuff here. So check out our website, check us out on YouTube, every social media platform. Um, the website will be linked below. Um, you know, we're pretty much ready to start taking clients as soon as possible. So if you're looking to book with North Pier Angley in 2021, 2022, rather, Go ahead and get on it and uh, we will hope to see you on the water. Thank you so much for being here and we will see you soon.